Hello everyone in the room and online. I am Francois de Salle, the CEO of the BVI International Arbitration Center. This is the beginning of day four of the fourth BVI International Arbitration Week. And I do hope that you had the opportunity to attend remotely or in person, most if not all of the fantastic sessions earlier in the week. I would like to thank the esteemed speakers who shared their time and wisdom with us on an eclectic mix of topics such as the greening of arbitration, third-party funding, the BVI IEC rules 2021 that will come into force on the 16th of November this year, trust arbitration, diversity, enforcement of investment treaty awards, and for all the topics that will take place today and tomorrow. There is more to come. BVR Arbitration Week 2021 was designed to be relevant to practitioners in the field of arbitration in the Caribbean and beyond. And it is our sincere hope that you found the program interesting. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors Harnes, Conyers, Ogier, Murand, Colas Krill, as well as our presenting partners, such as the BVI Arbitration Group, Cadrin, Quantum Global Solutions, Campaign for Greener Arbitrations, the Russian and CIS Arbitration Network, the BVI Bar Association, Caribbean Arbitrators, and all the supporting institutions, uh, like the OCS Bar Association, ICSID, CR, BVI Finance, and I forget many that made this conference already a success. Today, we have a great keynote speaker for you. Our speaker has had many lives. A barista, the head of the BVI London office, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, permanent secretary in the premier's office of the BVI, in the aftermath of the worst hurricane in the Northern Atlantic back in 2017, general counsel to the regulator, the Financial Services Commission of the BVI. She was also instrumental in promoting the passage of the Arbitration Act in 2013. She was also instrumental in the extension of the New York Convention to the Virgin Islands in 2014. She was also instrumental in the establishment of the BVI International Arbitration Center in 2016. And this is just the first paragraph of her CV. Most importantly, our speaker is kind, principled, humorous, and a great storyteller. Six years ago, she told me the story of a little big island in the Caribbean and its aspiration to become a premier arbitration jurisdiction, in addition to being a premier international business and finance center. Since then, that story has become a reality. A historical proponent of arbitration in the BVI, she has been called the phenomenon in the past, and she truly lives up to that today. Today, she's going to talk to us about the invisible end in international arbitration, self-interest and the public good. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Don J. Smith, Attorney General of the Virgin Islands. Thank you very much, Francois. And thank you for saying those very nice things about me. You said it so convincingly, I believe them. <laughs> um, earlier this week, I heard 
Mac Forte at the Dr. J.S. Archibald QC Memorial Lecture, struggle with the protocol of um, an online event or an hybrid event where there are people sitting in the room and there are people online, there are people watching on YouTube. I'm going to adopt the protocol that he established then for today's purposes and welcome everyone to hear me speak. When I was a little girl, and Francois did say I was a storyteller, and I used the word, lit word little because I was actually very little. I could barely write. When I was a little girl, I wrote on a, <clears throat> I wrote on a piece of paper that I would be a lawyer. I don't know why, I just made up my mind. However, when it came time to go to college, my father was convinced that at 16, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I spent the next four years broadening my horizons with a liberal arts education. I became acquainted with the social sciences. I studied humans, the way they, or should I say we, interact with each other and our environment, how our views and behaviors change or do not, depending on what happens around us and how actions and articulated thoughts impact the little big world that we live in. Somewhere in those four years, I was introduced to the concept of the invisible hand. Ever since, it has intrigued me, more so perhaps for what the term brings to my mind rather than what Adam Smith may have meant by it, although I will get to that. Why has arbitration remained relevant for centuries? Why does it continue to reach new heights, generate new rules and paradigms, promote consensus on the one hand, healthy debates on the other, and attract new and diverse institutions and professionals? Why does it thrive even in the midst of a global pandemic that kept the arbitration world well and truly grounded? In 1759, Adam Smith used the term invisible hand in his work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments where he described a landlord who was driven to distribute his bountiful harvest among the community only because he could not consume it all himself. In his words, the rich only select from the heap what is most precious and agreeable. They consume little more than the poor and in spite of their natural selfishness and rapacity, though they mean only their own convenience, though the sole end which they propose from the labors of all thousands whom they employ, be gratification of their own vain and insatiable desires, they divide with the poor the produce of all their improvements. They are led, he says, by an invisible hand to make nearly the same distribution of the necessaries of life which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions among all its inhabitants, and thus, without knowing it, advance the interest of society and afford the means to the multiplication of the species. Those who are much better placed than me to do so have had and have made good use of the opportunity over the past 260 plus years to debate, debunk, or deconstruct this concept of the invisible hand. I want to use it today to mean only the unintended social benefits and public good brought about by individuals acting in their own self-interest. In turn, I will take self-interest to mean a focus on one's needs or interests and the natural and often self-conscious actions that flow from that. To be clear, I do not think that self-interest in, is in and of itself a bad thing. Unless I be misunderstood, 
I should also say that I distinguish it from what I believe are well and truly vices. For example, greed, vengeance, or being plain old awkward, malicious, or idle. People need, desire, or are interested in different things. Some want the best for their fellow men, others and women. Others are excited by opportunity. Some want to apply their craft, trade, or profession simply for the sake of it. Others get a natural high from achievement and perfection. Others want to live in a modern progressive society. Looked at in this way, self-interest can create jobs and opportunities to enter new trades and professions. It can make us interact with people who are different, who challenge our views, who show us different ways of doing things, and who conversely can also learn from us and take our values and ideas to every corner of the globe. Writing nearly 100 years ago, one author wrote that the origin of arbitration is lost in obscurity. He says, at what time or place man first decided to submit to his chief or to his friends for a decision and a settlement with his adversary, instead of resorting to violence or self-help or to use the public legal machinery available is not known. And any inquiry of this sort would belong more properly in the history of social growth and ethics than in either law or economics. The same author always goes, also goes on to speak about what he calls a great jealousy. This was a great jealousy of the courts towards arbitration in an earlier time when judges did not have fixed salaries and their income depended on the number of cases litigated before them. At some other time, in another speech, which you may be privileged to hear, I will investigate that tidbit. Suffice it to say that anyone who has ever had to start a new arbitral institution in a jurisdiction captured by successful litigators will know that the great jealousy can still rear its head. We are fortunate that the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court has long recognized the right of parties to bind themselves to resolve their disputes otherwise than by litigation. We are also blessed to have a bar that doubtful at first that the legal and physical infrastructural improvements would be forthcoming, have embraced the concept of not being merely litigators but of being dispute resolution practitioners in a real and rounded way. This move has no doubt been assisted by the diversity of the Virgin Islands Bar, with persons from many regions, cultures, experience, and of course, needs and interests, recognizing and acting on pro-arbitration elements in their professional environment. Our eminent Chief Justice Dame Janice summed it up well earlier this week when at the end of delivering the fourth Dr. J.S. Archibald Queen's Council Memorial Lecture, she concluded that litigation and arbitration are happily wed. I extrapolated from that that there are still likely to be some disagreements here and there. As another example, how do we account for the origin and success of the New York Convention on the recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards? Signed in June 1958 and today boasting more than 160 parties, it has been described as the most successful treaty in private international law and as one of the pillars of today's broader legal system. In May 16 articles, the treaty focuses on two critical issues. One, that states will recognize and enforce arbitral awards. And secondly, that states will recognize agreements in writing under which the parties undertake to submit to arbitration all or any differences between them in respect of a defined legal relationship concerning a subject matter 
capable of settlement by arbitration. This is where it gets interesting. The text for the modern convention was first proposed by the International Chamber of Commerce or ICC in 1953 to improve the legal regime provided by the Geneva Protocol on Arbitration Clauses of 1923 and the Geneva Convention on the Execution of Foreign Arbitral Awards of 1927. On its website, the ICC itself proudly boasts that the ICC, and I'm quoting now, was founded in the aftermath of the First World War when no world system of rules governed trade, investment, finance, or commercial relations. Without waiting for governments to fill the gap, ICC's founders acted on their conviction that the private sector is best qualified to set global standards for business. They called themselves the merchant of peace. When it comes to the New York Convention, I imagine, and you too can, that the invisible hand was and continues to be at work there too. Together with the legal profession and academia, arbitral institutions and organizations have been collectively described as a community bound, not by national ties or by membership of any organization, but by common interest and shared expertise in a common activity. Arbitral institutions have been growing in number and influence and institutional arbitration now dominates the field. They are favored for providing pre-established rules and procedural frameworks for professional administrative and logistical support and for quality control through established panels of vetted arbitrators and the scrutiny of awards. They have also been challenged to strengthen or regulate the practice of arbitration in areas such as costs, professional conduct, training, and climate change. The Dr. J.S. Archibald QC Memorial Lectures signal the start of Arbitration Week in the BVI every two years. This is an event I cherish for the exchange of ideas, debates, and the opportunity to spend a few days with both aspiring and accomplished arbitration professionals. In the 2015 inaugural lecture, Lord Goldsmith Queen's Council foreshadowed the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators London Centenary Principles for an effective and efficient seat in international arbitration. He demonstrated that the Virgin Islands exemplified most of these principles and encouraged it on the way to establishing itself as an attractive seat and setting up an arbitral institution. The second distinguished personality to give the lecture was the common chairman of the board of the BVI IAC, John Beachy CBE, and that was in 2017. By that time, this center was an impressive reality. And in fact, it will soon celebrate its fifth anniversary. Mr. Beachy took stock and noted that the Virgin Islands and the BVI IAC were in good stead. However, he cautioned that restricted air access remained an issue. Four months later, Hurricane Irma hit the Virgin Islands on 6 September, 2017. It was devastating. Yet, a mere nine days later, the Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court announced the temporary relocation of the commercial division of the High Court to St. Lucia, and that judges of the commercial division would begin hearing matters in St. Lucia on the 25th of September. An emergency, practice, an emergency measures practice direction was issued and provided for the electronic filing of documents, service of documents by email, and for hearings by telephone, video conference, and in person. In stark contrast, all criminal matters were adjourned until further notice, 
and all other civil matters before the civil division uh, were also adjourned unless practitioners, litigants, and witnesses could travel to St. Lucia and be accommodated on a prearranged basis. Faced with the threat of adjournments and clients still insistent, insistent on having their disputes resolved, the commercial bar quickly focused on their needs and interests. And before you knew it, had collaborated with the court to ensure the continuity of their commercial practice, thereby transforming commercial and later civil litigation in the Virgin Islands. Little did they know that another great challenge was lurking in our collective futures. Fast forward three years and enter the COVID-19 pandemic. Having reestablished the physical infrastructure the BVI courts were shut down again, and the world struggled with the greatest public health challenge that many of us alive today may ever know. The lessons learned after Hurricane Irma then had to be honed, reapplied, and extended across the court system and throughout the region. Online hearings are now largely the order of the day, and the court's e-litigation portal in development for some years has finally been ushered in in all nine jurisdictions of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. I venture here to say that the commercial bar and arbitration practitioners have some interests and desires in common. The COVID-19 pandemic shut down air travel, forcing it from the arbitration menu. It closed hearing centers and sequestered us in our homes. Relocation of hearing rooms and personnel was not an option. Air access, once coveted and revered, was now out of the question. In fact, in most cases, it was prohibited. What did the arbitration world do? With incredible alacrity, the focus changed from air access to remote access and how good remote access could and needed to be. Arbitrators, practitioners, and support professionals quickly assimilated the tools that had been at their disposal for years. On the one hand, arbitrators and practitioners struggled with how to struggled with how to get themselves across effectively on video, but on the other hand, many soon, soon realized that it was much easier to observe facial expressions and mannerisms up close on a screen. The size and number of screens have multiplied. The quality of lighting and sound has improved. Arbitral institutions have worked together and individually to promulgate new rules and adjust their offerings. Because we live in a little big world, I was interested to learn of the 23 July 2020 decision of the Austrian Supreme Court confirming the right of an arbitral tribunal to hold remote hearings, even if one party objects on due process grounds. I don't speak German yet, so I'm grateful to Professor Maxi Scherer and the co-authors of the 24 October 2020 post on the Kluwer arbitration blog for distilling the key points. In that case, the respondents in an arbitration seated in Vienna and administered by the Vienna International Arbitration Center had challenged the arbitral tribunal over its decision to conduct an evidentiary hearing remotely. It was to be done by video conference. The Austrian Supreme Court ruled among other things that remote arbitration hearings are not only permissible if both parties agree, but also over the objection of one of the parties and relied on Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which provides for a party's right to get effective access to justice and to be heard. The court also took notice of the prevailing local and industry circumstances noting that the local government promoted the use of video conferencing technology for judicial proceedings and that commentators had endorsed the use of remote hearings in arbitral proceedings during the pandemic. 
Interestingly, the court did not consider that the risk of witness tampering was any greater remotely than in person and actually identified some benefits of remote hearings in preventing it. The centenary principles I referred to earlier cover 10 areas, the law, the judiciary, legal expertise, education, right of representation, accessibility and safety, facilities, ethics, enforceability, and immunity. In light of the developments in the remote space, the Virgin Islands and the BVI IAC has a superb opportunity for some leapfrogging when it comes to accessibility and safety. Clearly, access must now include remote access and security must now extend to cyber security. The oral, excuse me, the oral tradition is foundational in international arbitration. Congresses, conferences, and seminars have been undeniably front, center, and effective in its growth and development. Gathering in numbers and in persons was no longer feasible, and my heart sank when I realized, for example, that there could be no ICA 2020 because of the pandemic. I miss my colleagues, but lo and behold, we found other ways to meet and exchange ideas. I, for one, was enthralled by the conversations with Neil series put on by Delos Dispute Resolution. I also, for the record, very much enjoy arbitration life with Janet and Hannah right here at the BVI IAC. These and similar programs that came to the fore during the pandemic have afforded rare insights for existing and aspiring arbitration professionals into the lives and times of the interviewees, all incredibly accomplished and despite their imminence, refreshingly human. An opportunity to spend an hour with such diverse personalities and learn how they got started in their careers, how they work, their views on current issues in the practice and so on, would have been a rare event for most. Now exposure to that wealth of knowledge, ideas and culture, which is so critical in arbitration can happen on demand. It was the oral tradition at work, unhindered by differences in time, space, culture, age, or whatever else is used to differentiate us. Why hadn't we thought of this before? Many of us believe that we can get the pandemic under control. And some may even be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. The question is, where do we go from here? <clears throat> so far this week, we have been asking this question. We will ask it again several times over the next two days. We will keep asking it after we leave. I have noticed that following an extreme event, we just want to get back to normal, to the way the things used to be, rather than adapt or explore new ways of doing things. The reality is that it is part of our humanity to want to go back to the way things were, to what worked for us. That is, if we were comfortable in that space. For others, extreme events bring not only the drive for survival, but opportunity. Many years ago now, in the life of a relatively young woman, I bought a book called The End of Lawyers. Yes, this is another story, Francois. Being a young lawyer and looking forward to a long and dynamic career, the title troubled me. So I had to get to the bottom of his thinking. In a more recent work, The Online Courts and the Future of Justice, Mr. Suskind delivers the message to all professionals that clients do not really want them. In his words, they want the outcomes that professionals bring. These outcomes have two dimensions, 
practical results, a job done, and emotional effects, an appropriate feeling perhaps of reassurance or confidence. And when these outcomes can be reliably delivered in new ways that are demonstrably cheaper, better, quicker, or more convenient than the current offering, we can expect the market to switch to the alternatives. It follows, he says, that litigants do not really want courts, judges, lawyers, rules of procedure, and the rest. More likely, they want not to have a problem at all or to have their disputes resolved fairly and with finality. Or they might want vindication or someone to listen and empathize with their grievances or an apology. He goes on. And I'm telling you this because it's worth repeating. Many lawyers and professionals bark at this line of what he calls outcome thinking. They insist that what a client surely needs and will always need is a trusted advisor, an empathetic and expert human counselor. But this, he says, is to confuse means with ends, to model up how we work with what we deliver. It is to assume that there's something intrinsically valuable, indispensable even in our current ways of working. It is to fixate on today's processes and disregard their broader purpose. He then says, I challenge whether the working practices of these professionals in and of themselves are of such value that they should be retained at all costs, that they should be retained at all costs in the face of alternative services that clients and customers find prefer preferable. For those of us who are still refusing to catch his drift, he sums it up in this way. I find myself, in other words, favoring the interests of patients over doctors, of clients over lawyers, and of students over teachers. Adam Smith helps me here, he says. In the wealth of nations, he argues that consumption is the sole end and purpose of all production and the interest of the producer ought to be attended to only so far as it may be necessary for promoting that of the consumer. <clears throat> it seems to me that we are back to the realm of the invisible hand. In other words, the users of arbitrators are the actors most likely to determine what's next, because they have options. We will have to align our desires and interests to meet their demands. Finally, I go back to the memorial lectures. In the third lecture, Wendy Miles pushed the, Wendy Miles pushed the BVI IAC as an arbitral institution and also us as international lawyers to address the climate emergency. She challenged us to reason, to develop thinking and explore beyond our normal boundaries of thought. She challenged us to use our training, expertise and experience in resolving disputes and also specifically our legal expertise in aid of this. In 2020, global carbon dioxide emissions dropped by about 7% the biggest annual increase since the end of the Second World War. As restrictions and lockdowns ended, emissions returned to their normal levels. I will say candidly that when I look around the world, I usually feel helpless, that whatever contribution I make will not be enough to make a difference, that whatever gains I help to make will be eroded by someone or some jurisdiction or some business or other organization whose interest is in living only for today or in winning at any cost. However, in Monday's panel on the greening of arbitration, one of my predecessors in office, Dancia Penn Queens Council, reminded us about the power of one. Also this week, Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados delivered 
a resounding and powerful message to all leaders at COP26 that will keep me on the bandwagon indefinitely. I therefore use this opportunity to encourage all of us to do what we can do to save our world. Rather than seeking to go back where we were, consider the Green Pledge and commit to measures such as avoiding unnecessary travel and using video conferencing facilities as an alternative and to considering and questioning the need to fly at all times and offsetting carbon emissions for any arbitration related travel. Before I close, I offer my congratulations and gratitude to and express my admiration for all those who have sustained the momentum in the development of the Virgin Islands as an arbitration jurisdiction. It is no mean feat. Had minds not met, had the stars not aligned, had the invisible hand not been at work, we would not have seen the modern arbitration act. We would not have seen the extension of the New York Convention or an arbitration friendly <clears throat> lab, excuse me, <clears throat> this is worth repeating. It is no main feat. Had minds not met, had the stars not aligned, had the invisible hand not been at work, we would not have seen the modern arbitration act, the extension of the New York convention and arbitration friendly labor and immigration policies. We may not have had the fourth biennial memorial lecture or be on the brink of the fifth anniversary of the BVI IAC. We would not have seen the development and growth of the BVI arbitration group. We can go on, but I must stop here today. Recently, the Honorable Premier reminded me that it's the dream work. That is evident here. The invisible hand is doing its thing. Thank you, and I wish all of us a successful conference. Dear Honorable Smith, this was motivational, informative, memorable, and entertaining. As usual, I may add, um, I, on behalf of the BVRIAC and the entire, let me call it fraternity of arbitration here, and on my own behalf, extend a very sincere vote of thanks to you, Honorable Smith, uh, for sharing with us your thoughts and opinions today. I particularly enjoyed the story of the little girl who wanted to be a lawyer to end up the head of the judiciary here in the BVI. Um, I also particularly enjoyed your thoughts on what the new normal may look like. Um, and I wanted to thank you um, on your vision for the BVI and the help that you've provided to um, bolster arbitration and the BVI as an arbitral jurisdiction. Thank you. For our online audience, please stay tuned for the next panel that will take place at 10 a.m. AST. Uh, it's uh, the in-house counsel perspective in international arbitration with Maria Irene Peruccio, Sebastian Partida, Sebastian Sebastian Ribeck and Arabella Diorio, um, starting at 10. Thank you very much. <laughs>